All right, uh, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here at Nicholson Library with Veronique Boss Druin. Uh, it's June 26, 2019, uh, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Veronique. We really appreciate this. Uh, we're going to start by asking you why wine? Why wine? It was probably fairly obvious to me <laughs> because I was born in a wine family. I was, uh, as you probably can tell when I speak, I'm not from here, I'm not native from Oregon or the US. I was born in Burgundy, in a wine family, and on top of that, on a special day in Burgundy, which was the Spice de Bone Wine Auction Day, <laughs> and the second thing that happened is that Thursday I got a little drop of wine given to me, and it was a 56, but an 1856. <laughs> So I don't know, it's like everything was uh, meant to be. But uh, I have to say, even though I was born in a wine family, uh, my father is a winemaker, I didn't think I would do that because I have a father, I have three brothers, and around me there was only boys working in the cellar or uh, in the winery. So Burgundy at the time was very much for men. Mm -hmm. The women were working but mostly in the vineyards, mm -hmm. pulling branches and some work in the vineyards. But when I got 10 years old, my uh, two things happened. My father hired a woman to help him. He was, the company was growing, he was creating a little lab and he did need someone to help run this lab. And so he hired a young person. She happened to be the daughter of a producer from Pomar. Mm -hmm. She was not yet an enologist, she was very young. But he took her with him to taste wine and he realized that she was really skilled. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I'll help you, but you should pursue studies of uh, winemaking, and she did. And so she became the first woman winemaker in Burgundy. Her name is Laurence Jobard, and it was rare at the time. And so I was 10 years old when that happened, and it was kind of an eye-opener. If she did it, mm -hmm. I could do it, mm -hmm. and I kind of grew next to her. The, the second thing that happened is when I, it was my birthday, my father usually would take a bottle of our birth year, and when you are six or seven, you don't realize what you are drinking, but you, when you're 10, you start to be a little more aware. Mm -hmm. And it was a Chambertin Clos de Bèze, uh, 1962. And that wine was like unbelievable to me. And so all this combined, and the fact that we were living next to the winery, I was playing with my brothers at the cellar all the time. It's just mm -hmm. an environment that I adored. Okay. And so when I was little, I thought I'm going to be a pianist because I love music. But of course, I played the piano, but not very well. So that was not really <laughs> something I was going to do. Still played. But then when all this uh, happened to be possible for me, mm -hmm. my dad encouraged me. So when I fin finished my school, when I was 17, he, um, yeah, he said, why don't you try the winemaking diploma in, in Dijon? So I did two years of... Uh, first two years of more generic science studies, biology, chemistry, and, mm -hmm. and then it's a two-year winemaking program in the University of Dijon. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one more year of research. And then if you want to know the connection with Oregon, that's when it happened. Okay, so let's talk yeah. about that then. So you're, you've decided this is what you want to do, you're in school, so let's talk yes. about the connection with Oregon. I am in school and when you, uh, or in the program, there is some internship that you need to do, which is a very common thing. So my first internship, I decided to go to Bordeaux because it's another, of course, famous region from France that I sh felt I should know better. Mm -hmm. um, and it was easy, it was close, so I went there in 1984. And then that, after that, I did my uh, last year of winemaking and then I started my um, research program, which was just for one year. And then I thought, it would be fun to have an experience in a new world. A new world could be New Zealand, that mm -hmm. was an option. It was, but the most obvious for me was California. For one reason, uh, my father and Robert Mondavi were very close friends. So I used to see Robert in Bone and uh, my dad would visit him a lot. And he was such a nice man and a uh, you know, really wonderful person. Mm -hmm. So I said to my dad, do you think he would take me as an intern? And my dad said, I think he would. But if I were you, I would go to Oregon. Wow. So this is 1986, mm -hmm. the beginning of the year of 1986. And so, of course, I said, where is Oregon and why would I go there? 
and then he tells me his story of his connection with, with Oregon, which maybe you know and have heard. His first visit to the Valley in 1961. Oh he's, he's very young. He's selling his wines with his distributor in California. Mm -hmm. And his California, which I remember very well, a charming man called Jimmy Blumen. And so the company of Jimmy was selling the Drouin wines. And he said, Robert, let's go up the road along the coast because first it's beautiful, but let's go to Oregon and also open the market there. So they did. And when they arrived in the valley, my father was like, it's interesting how this valley is similar to the Côte d'Or, you know, with slopes and facing east. And, mm -hmm. But of course, there's no one growing grapes here. Goes back to Burgundy, time goes on. And then there's this tasting in Paris, which was became quite famous because of the Bordeaux rivalry with California but also Oregon was in the loop. And my father was a little bit surprised of the results of that tasting, where a wonderful wine from David Letts, the famous South Block 75 Pinot, mm -hmm. did so well at the tasting. So my dad was like a bit uh, surprised. Uh, and he wasn't sure what was happening. He said, how can you know wine like not from Burgundy do so well in this tasting? And it was not the only New World Pinot proposed, but that's the one that did the best. Mm -hmm. So he did reorganize a tasting in Burgundy with his own wine and the, probably the top 10 Pinot that did that tasting. David Lett came second, mm -hmm. so very close to, uh, to you know, the best uh, of the wines. So he thought this is not just luck, it's mm -hmm. a really good wine, so there must be a reason. So when I came into the idea of coming to the New World, that's why he suggested. He said, I came across a really nice Pinot, sometimes technically not perfect, <laughs> because maybe they don't have all the tools that we do have, mm -hmm. but potentially, I think there's a good potential in Oregon. So he said, maybe we should try and find families that would take you, and that we were not sure if anyone would take me. And so we are distributed here by a company called Henny Hinsdale. Mm -hmm. And he, is, he knows Karen in his day for a long time, and Stephen Carey. Mm -hmm. So he writes to both of them, and they say, oh, we will ask, we are selling the wines of a few pioneers, and so we will ask if one of them is willing to take Veronique. So these people were Bethel Heights, mm -hmm. Edelstein, mm -hmm. and Irie. Mm -hmm. And the funny part, and so nice part, is like they all said, yes, we will take Veronique. So rather than choosing one of them, I decided to go and work with all of them. <laughs> so my first, uh, so here I arrived in September of 1986 with my suitcase and very little experience to help them for the harvest. Mm. One of my best memory. 86 was not easy, but you know, with David Alsan, we would, uh, the, the winery was below the house and there were great musicians, so we would, and great cooks, so we would make the wine and play music and cook and this is, with the Castile, the kids were very little, mm -hmm. so playing with the children and also um, just wonderful. And with David and Diana and Jason, uh, it, it was such, you know, wonderful. And Jim, it was a wonderful moment. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, walking the dogs every night with David and philosophy. Uh, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, something that it, it was like for me yesterday. I remember almost every day of it. And for my birthday, they invited the whole valley as a surprise because I, they say you should go and to California to visit. So I went for two weeks, visit, come back by myself, rented a car, stopped on the way. I don't know if I would do it anymore, but <laughs> um, drove and would stop in a motel and visit. And, and then when I arrived, David said, and it's a Sunday, and David says, uh, we have some topping to do today. And it's my birthday, but I didn't tell them. And I said, okay, let's go do some toppings. And, and I need to drop some wine at Nick's for mm -hmm. the restaurant, which was an un not unusual to do. Mm -hmm. So here we go in this beautiful Jaguar, green Jaguar, and we're driving and we obviously didn't go to the winery, but we went to Nick's and then every people that I had met during my four months were there. And it was amazing, <laughs> balloons and... Uh, <laughs> and then they all came with me to the airport. I had a big celebration at the airport the next day. <laughs> so That's it's, amazing. Yeah, and so the rest is, so we get, get back to Burgundy, of course we stay connected. I get a little note from David every year. I said, I adopted you as my daughter in Oregon. He has two sons, so I became his daughter in Oregon. And he would never miss one year where I got my little birthday card. And Jim is the same, and I still do, from Jim that gets a little birthday card every year. In 14 languages he writes, happy birthday. <laughs> it's quite special, huh? So I, um, 
I'm back in Bowen and I start to work for the company in Bowen. And then I think it's David Adelstein who said to, to my father, Robert, would it be a challenge or something interesting for you to make wine here in Oregon? And my father said, yes, it would be really interesting uh, with all the experience I have. And I, you know, I believe into what you do in Oregon, but I don't have the time because I'm making wine in Burgundy. It's too close as the harvest time to Oregon. Mm -hmm. So they understood, but they didn't, I would say they did not um, let the idea go. Mm -hmm. And so in June of 87, it's the first IPNC. Mm -hmm. And they did invite my father to be a speaker. And at the same time, they said, Robert, there's a beautiful piece of property, a piece of property for sale. So you, you should go and see it. We'll take you. So, so then he speaks to me and he said, um, OK, let's go. So I go with him. And we arrive. And before the IPNC, David Adelson takes us on the property TDO, where there's just wheat being grown and the tall trees that are still next to the winery now. So we go up here. It's a gorgeous day. And, and I remember my father looked at me and he said, you know, I really believe in two here. Yeah, we should try. Mm. So it's, it was not just because the site was nice. He had done a little bit of soil research and he knew, of course, he had tasted some wine. But, uh, and the land was not very expensive. So he buys the land. And he says, it's 87, he says, we should make wine quickly to see what we are capable to do and if we like it. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, but we don't have a winery, we don't have grapes, and we don't have equipment. Other than that. Other than that. <laughs> because he asked me, would you be willing to be making the wine, of course, with help. Mm -hmm. But he still had the problem of needing to be in Burgundy. Mm -hmm. So I had no idea what I was signing up for. I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know that the adventure was going to be what it has been. And I have no regret, but it, you know, the path hasn't been that easy. <laughs> And so he said, but we'll buy grapes. There's, there was quite a few growers mm -hmm. of Pinot. Uh, we'll try to find a place and we will send equipment from Burgundy. So that's what we did. Wow. We stole a few fermenters, six exactly from Burgundy. We bought three and we found some equipment in, in California, you know, one pump, used pump from Mondavi. I bought a little press that had an accident on the plane coming to Oregon. <laughs> so <laughs> the first time I use it, it blows off. <laughs> uh, we had no water in that little storage place. So the place we first made Didier wine is, uh, has changed name, but the original name was Veritas. Mm -hmm. And that's across from uh, Rex Hill mm -hmm. on 99W. Mm -hmm. It was um, a very lovely man called uh, John Howison who owns this little winery. And then he sold it to Harry Nedry, so it became Shehelen. Mm -hmm. So, but the first winery for Didi, or the first home, was the storage building of what is today Shehelen Winery. So the tanks are outside, the press is outside, there's infinite inside, and uh, voila. So '88, we uh, we buy from six different producers just to see from different sites if there was. Uh, some terroir mm -hmm. expression already for, for us to see. And I remember the first day the grapes arrived, my father said, oh, we have to celebrate this moment. So we took a bottle of Burgundy, it was a Chambon Musigny Premier Cru, and he said, uh, we will not copy this wine because it's from Burgundy, but it's Pinot Noir, so we should be inspired by the style of this wine. Mm -hmm. And Chambon for Drouin is a village we very much like for the beautiful quality of the expression of Pinot it gives, mm -hmm. very elegant, very refined. And so that really never left me. It's kind of a guide in uh, when I make wine mm -hmm. here. But of course, it's different soil. The climate is somewhat a little bit different, too. So this is 88. And then we, we liked what we did. But we said maybe we should have our friends taste the wine. So we take samples back to Burgundy when the malolactic is finished. And we have racked the wine. And we have friends tasting the wine in Bone and they say, Robert, you're totally crazy. Nobody knows Oregon, it's going to be so hard to sell these wines, but they are very good. <laughs> so it was a good encouragement and they say, okay, we need a place, so let's build the winery. Mm -hmm. And the, so the trick was to find an architect because not really major wineries had been built here. Not that the winery is big, but <laughs> so we, we, there was a lot of thinking in how, what we want and where do we put it on the side, but obviously the place was obvious with the view we said oh, we should put it here and the architect they started with three we started with three architects and then 
came to, to one, Ernie Munch, who mm -hmm. was wonderful. He came to Burgundy, he kind of understood what we wanted, but we said, you will be, you will design this winery, but we want a little French touch to it. So the roof, the tiles came from France, mm -hmm. the floor in the tasting room came from France, but other than that, everything came from, and from here, beautiful wood. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I remember one thing, for example, there's a stucco, something not used here in the past, maybe now, and I'm not an expert, but I was the one who had to decide when it was time to put the stucco. So I take a little course in Burgundy for stucco flying. <laughs> <laughs> just, another, just another trick to have up your sleeve, another right? Another trick to have, which I never used again. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we built this uh, winery in 1989. The, the ground broke in March and we had grapes coming in September of 89. So it was very tricky because the winery was not finished. The tanks had been waiting outside the summer under the trees, which was a mistake because a lot of the sap came to the, mm. to the tank, so the, the flavor and to clean it was very hard. The barrels had been waiting outside, so they were extremely dry, so and I was filling them with water to get them rehydrated. They were leaking as fast as those. Couldn't use the cellite was being painted, so I mean, it could go on and on and on. But these are all great memories. And at the time I had one or two friends coming to help. Um, but beside that, we decided to plant, of course, at the mm -hmm. same time. And mm -hmm. I would say, probably more than the rest, how to plant, what to plant, how to farm, and what would be the philosophy behind how we would do it, was probably maybe the most um, important thing we had to decide. Mm -hmm. And that is the world of my brother Philippe and my father. Um, not that I was not connected to that, of course I was a little bit, but less than they were. Mm -hmm. Because the page was white, and of course in Oregon, compared to Burgundy, where we have very strict regulations, mm -hmm. we could do anything. Plants the way we wanted, the density we wanted, the mm -hmm. clones we wanted, although there was not many clones available, only two. Uh, could be grafted, not grafted. Everybody was saying, we don't have phylloxera. This is 1988, we have no phylloxera. It's expensive to graft, so Robert, you know, we shouldn't worry about that. And my dad said, I do worry, because we went through that in, in Europe where Philoxera sadly killed all the vines mm -hmm. in Europe, so I'm going to graft. Your choice. And in 1991, as you know, Philoxera was discovered in Oregon. So everybody said, Robert, you were so smart. He said, no, I wasn't smart. I just had the experience mm -hmm. from what happened in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So Philippe and uh, my father really um, brainstorm a lot do we do 10,000 vines per hectare, which we do in Burgundy, and decided not to. Said we, but they wanted to have a higher density than what was commonly done. And the reason most of the vines were planted more 4,500 plants per hectare was because the equipment couldn't farm narrow road. It was just simply a technical problem. So they go to seven, the choice has been to do 7,000. So one meter between the vines, 1.3 meter between the rows. So you see you can't farm that with local equipment. So a tractor is set from Bonn, <laughs> the very famous Bobard blue tractor, the over-the-road tractor, with all the problem that leads. Who is going to drive it? Who is going to fix it? Uh, <laughs> so that is another book that could be written about the viticulture. I think I brought a whole tractor with me in spots <laughs> in my suitcase. <laughs> Uh, now we, I think we have the third tractor, I think it's the third that arrived, maybe the fourth tractor over the road. But uh, voila, then the yield was also, what do we reach? So we targeted something which would be for us the equivalent of Premier Cru in Burgundy, something at 40, 45 hectoliters per hectare. Of course, sometimes naturally you have more, some years we had less, but that's the idea. And um, the clone was interesting. There was only Venusville and Pomar clone available, so we used those. And then we made the one from those and we liked it, but we thought the variety of clone would be important mm -hmm. if we could have more. Mm -hmm. So when Dijon, and thanks to David Alsan, we really worked hard to help mm -hmm. select clones. When, so when Dijon and Oregon State and Davis, I think, were all working together, it took maybe four or five years, I don't remember exactly, but the Dijon clones Mm -hmm. Which makes me funny the name because Dij Dijon has no vineyard, so they were selected in Dijon, but the cause the, the clones came from all the villages from Burgundy. But <laughs> of course, it's funny to talk about Dijon clones. There's no vineyards in Dijon. It used to be in the past, but not anymore. 
So when we got the choice to have more, we decided to plant them all. So we had, it's not that many, maybe five. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting to see which would be the best uh, clone with rootstock, because we didn't know. So mm -hmm. unless you try, mm -hmm. is it 3309, is it 1616, is it Riparia? Uh, we knew what the soil type was. We didn't know so much the water resources in the soil. So, and the type of vintages can be so different. So sometimes mm -hmm. a clone does better, or a rootstock does better than the other, just because it's very dry or because it's very wet. So the viticulture has, uh, had a, it was important for us, mm -hmm. how we farm it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm curious, when you came here, what your initial impression of was of Oregon, and also what your, the initial reception to not just you being here, but then the investment by, mm -hmm. your, by your family. Well, I have to say, the, first the welcome we got from the community, which was very small. I think there were about 35 bonded wineries when mm -hmm. we came. Well, I think it's today 780, I was told at uh, OPC this mm -hmm. weekend. But I don't think we would have stayed if the welcome we had was like friends, not like strangers coming, but friends coming. Mm -hmm. it, it really makes a big difference. And then I've heard my father saying very often that also the governor at the time, Nick Gutschmidt, mm -hmm. was so helpful mm -hmm. in helping for finance uh, the, the whole project. And that really played a big role in the fact that we decided to invest and stay mm -hmm. in Oregon. Mm -hmm. yeah. And hey, what was your initial impression of the, the 35 or so bonded wineries here in Oregon? Well, most of those are were making Ponzi, Eras, Adelsheim, Irie. I mean, you take those, uh, Bethel Heights, mm -hmm. they were really making delicious wine with, you know, equipment that is not as so uh, technically, the performance of equipment of today is even better than back then. So we, we were impressed by the quality. What we didn't know is the aging potential mm -hmm. of those wines, except we had a few wines from the 70s, which was, uh, I mean, it was only 10, 10, 12 years old, but enough to say they can, they can age. Mm -hmm. So the impression was uh, very good. The, the, the thing that was un unbelievable was the quality of the fruit. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean when the fruit looks nice that the wine is going to be good. But coming from Burgundy at a time where we still were having some difficult years, now maybe it's global warming, maybe, I don't know, but the quality of the grapes or the healthiness of the grapes is more consistent in Burgundy in the past, since the 90s, but this is still the 80s. You didn't see a berry with Botrytis. I mean, it sounds obvious, but it was not for me, because mm -hmm. I always had seen vineyards coming with a little bit of a tractis, so you had salting table. Mm -hmm. And the quality of the fruit was uh, incredible. Mm -hmm. And then the wine was good, so I was like, oof, gee, this is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a little bit easier. Sure. Less disease, you mm -hmm. have less disease pressure here than we do mm -hmm. uh, there. We've, here, we've done a lot of these interviews, as you know, and for many people who were here when DDO was started, they talk about that being kind of a seminal moment for Oregon wine in terms mm -hmm. of maybe this is legit, maybe this is going to be something. The French, the French are here and they're investing, so that must mean we have something special here. Mm -hmm. Did you have a, a sense at the time that, of the importance of what you were doing to the industry? Uh, I, I do realize it now. You know, at the time, I didn't realize how much the impact was. It was a little more when we started to travel around because we made 88, 89, and we didn't sell 88 until we had made 89 mm -hmm. and it was ready to sell. I think my dad was thinking, maybe they will think we were lucky with 88. <laughs> the one is good, but maybe it was luck. So he said, let's make two vintages first to see if we are happy with two vintages in a row, which were quite different. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in 91, we start our road trip to present the wines. And then I kind of realized how interested people were to taste the wines that we were making here in Oregon. Mm -hmm. So, well, the, it really, is bringing some um, interest. And then I've heard over and over and over by all my friends here say, you know, thank, we, we can't thank your dad enough for coming and believing in Oregon and doing this. And so yeah, I do realize that uh, the fact that he chose not the easy way coming here, mm -hmm. he didn't look for doing something beside Burgundy. It just happened that I came here, we became friends with the local producer. They encouraged him to mm -hmm. do they found us the place. So he was not looking. He was not on the phone with a broker saying, can you find me some land? He never did. Yeah. And so it's just, there's no hazard, but the, the chance or every pieces came together. Sure. 
But I think he was very pleased one day he was told there was a Robert Drouin day. I don't know when that was, June something. <laughs> and, um, you know, he's never someone who is going to say, oh, I'm so proud. But I think he was really touched mm -hmm. that people recognized that the fact that he had the courage to do this. Mm -hmm. It was a big investment for, for the company. Not so much the land, but the building, the winery at the time was, uh, yeah. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Was there a goal in mind when you started? Was there a, was, was it, this is going to stick around forever, this is going to be a big part of our company, or we're just going to kind of try this out and see what happens? Did you have a goal in mind? Well, the first goal, always heard from him, is let's make good wines. That was really the goal, let's make good wines, mm -hmm. the ones that we are proud of. And then, of course, it's business. So you can't just finance it and say, if it doesn't work, it's okay. For us, it would not have been okay. And so uh, he said, there's three key for us to be successful here. First is uh, the reputation, the distribution, and the quality of wine. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, we do have a name that's well known in the US through Trois from Burgundy. Mm -hmm. We already have a distribution network because all wines from Burgundy has, are being sold to the US. Mm -hmm. So that was a big advantage. And he said, the third thing is to make good wines. And so he said, if we succeed in that, we should be fine. The one thing that was um, for him had to decide it what price am I going to sell these wines. Mm -hmm. So this is back in 1991. Oregon wine is uh, not so widely distributed. Locally, yes, Pacific Northwest, but all over the US maybe not so much. And I don't remember at what price David Lett or Alessandro were selling them wines, but I know he, the way he decided it was we would taste the wines back in Burgundy and compare them to our wines, not to see is it better or not as good, but whether they fit in the category of Bourgogne, Village, Premier Cru and Grand Cru. Mm -hmm. And he said, really, to be honest, I am as proud as, as I am of my uh, best village and even some Premier Cru. But he said, let's not pretend we are there yet. And he said, what's the price of a good village like Gevray Chambertin? Thirty-five dollars. I think we should sell them at 35. So again, people are like, ooh, ooh, Robert, that's expensive. Huh? <laughs> but I think now everyone says thank you, because they, he said there was no reason to bargain the wine. It's a lot of work. Pinot Noir is very expensive to produce. Mm -hmm. I got the question recently, so why is Pinot Noir expensive to produce? Well, the, you think of it, the density of plantation. Mm -hmm. Each little vine will need care. It's a lot of man time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a variety you can't produce much. If you crop too much, the wine won't be good. So you don't produce much. The yield mm -hmm. is low. So all these added things makes a Pinot is expensive to produce, um, maybe more than Chardonnay's, because Chardonnay can yield a little bit more mm -hmm. and it will be okay. And so here we are with the 35 law. So some of the comments about the wines are very good, yeah, but the price is certainly, you know, in the higher range of what we thought it would be. Mm -hmm. uh, and But in 30 years, we only have raised the wine to, now it's 45 US dollars. So we still, have, I think, have been uh, fair with them. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. What was the reaction uh, among your neighboring wineries in Burgundy to this kind of crazy Oregon proposition? Do you have any recollection of what anybody back there was talking about? Yeah, the they they were very uh, admirative, so they, they admire the a lot the carriage of my father. I don't. I think they they thought this is this is a um, he's playing with this. It's just to. It's not that they didn't take this seriously because they knew it was an investment, but. Um, at the time, no one was thinking, oh, it's interesting. Maybe I should look into Oregon. Now it's happening, but it's 30 years mm -hmm, later. Mm -hmm. So the response was, they, they recognized the wine was good. We, for, for our own surprise, they would sometimes do blind tasting and include our wine from Oregon that we'd not necessarily recognize. And so they would trick us. We did it, but also a little bit with them, but we didn't want to you know, make them like, Oh, you didn't recognize uh, your own wine, or uh, <laughs> uh, so a good welcome. Like I think a good admiration for what we were doing, but thinking you're a bit crazy. And then what happened next is to make the wine you need help, and now it's very common. Everyone gets interns, mm -hmm. but at the time I was probably the only one who would get not the only one, but I would get interns from Burgundy and from New Zealand and from other places, uh, two or three at the time, now I get a little bit more. They would go back to Burgundy and talk about what they saw, what mm -hmm. they tasted, what they see, the, the ambiance. And then little by little you get these kids coming back, taking over their families' 
uh, winery mm -hmm. because it's the second generation, mm -hmm. third generation, fourth generation, whatever. But they're growing and they're taking over. And they say, Pooh, this is impressive. And so a good example is uh, Thibaut Gaget, who is the son of Pierre-Henri Gaget, who runs uh, Maison Louis Jadot. And then the next year, I get a phone call from his father. He said, it's not official yet, but you will still read it in the press. We just bought some, uh, an estate mm -hmm. in Oregon. And I remember he was the one for years said, we are from Burgundy, we will remain in Burgundy. But, I mean, it's very nice and very honest to say we recognize also that this is a great place. Mm -hmm. And then Meo Camuse, uh, did it. I didn't have any of his kids as an intern, but he is a close friend, so we would taste the wine regularly. Mm -hmm. And he came and... Uh, so it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The wine kind of brought them, brought them to the real reality. Right, yeah. but it was not like in five years or even 10 years mm -hmm. or even 20 years. <laughs> it took mm -hmm. about 30 years. But mm -hmm. I mean, 30 years on the scale of a wine region is, is not much. Sure. Yeah. Sure. yeah. So let's talk about your personal kind of growth into the job. You said you kind mm -hmm. of came over here with education, not a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. and, you're in a, and you're in a place you've never tried to grow grapes before or make wine. So tell me about your kind of journey through into making yourself comfortable making Oregon wine. Well, I have to say I had a lot of help from from back in Burgundy. So, of course, uh, I was not alone. I was alone most of the year once the wine was made and in barrels. Then I would be the only one to come. There was the general manager and me. <laughs> so just the two of us. And he was very busy because the building was uh, being established. And so he and I would, he would do the topping of the barrels and I would come to do the racking. And then he and I would do the blending and then we would uh, get a little help to do the bottling. Mm -hmm. There's a guy that I love, he's retired now, but he came a lot. I learned so much from him to fix pumps, fix press, work on electrical things, because you had to be independent. Mm -hmm. And so a very interesting journey for me, learning from, from these people. So I did get the help mm -hmm. just for the year. It was a lot of work. And I was a very good forklift driver. Well, now I have help, but I love it. I was in the cellar by myself music and driving my barrels, <laughs> doing my racking, <laughs> or do my little finding. I remember one time going to Costco, I buy 400 eggs, and so the lady with the cashier was like, what are you going to do with all these eggs? Just couldn't explain to her, it was too complicated. And um, here I am, breaking my little eggs, taking the white, giving the yolk to the wives of uh, our crew mm -hmm. in the vineyard. And, um, I mean, lots of great memories. So then I grew and I was becoming a little more confident and I got more experience. And, mm. But of course, my father was always tasting, and he still is, tasting with me back uh, in Burgundy when he's available, when he can. And Laurence Jobard at the time, and she retired in 2005, and our new head enologist in Bonne Jérôme for Brac is a wonderful person. If I um, have some questions or some doubts, I, of course, can always discuss with him. So what do you think of that? And so... Now, of I, I, course, I feel, uh, I feel okay, and my <laughs> father, he still comes during harvest, mm -hmm. um, but he can't go all over the vineyards as, as, mm -hmm. as easily as he's used to. My brother, Philippe, still comes also. Mm -hmm. Philippe comes three or four times a year. He's in charge of the entire viticulture. Big role, mm -hmm. um, big decision is when do we pick, and so I'm very happy when he can be here, but he's doing the same thing in Burgundy. Mm -hmm. So sometimes our vintages overlap. So if they do, it has to stay, and I'm okay. It's a little bit easier than Burgundy, where we have vineyards all over, the wineries in Bonn, and the vines mm -hmm. are all over here. It's the winery surrounded by the, the mm -hmm. vineyards. Now we have Rose Rock, that's the chapter two of mm -hmm. our, of our um, adventure in Oregon. And so he needs to go and see that, and if he can't, I'll, I will do it. It's a beautiful place, I love it. You can go early in the morning. But to decide when to pick is very important, mm -hmm. so I like when he's here. And um, yeah, he's, he's very focused, he's very, uh, Philippe is incredible. He will talk to his phone or to his little recording thing and then he types everything. So he's years of records. And I have one cupboard with uh, every vintage since 1988. I'm a paper person, I still write everything. And so I have one book per vintage. Mm. So all my little archives are in one cupboard. I have, I have a home for those in the future. I'm just thinking about where, <laughs> those, where those could go in the future. Yeah, my kids say, Mom, you have to do, you use iPad. And of course, I, I have a lot of things on my computer, but I kind of like my little, mm -hmm. it's a red book, and it just says DDO. Now it's 2018, and I have all my Chardonnay, Pinot, tasting notes, analysis, what happened, blah, blah. <laughs> and with your little book, 
We started in 94, so usually my mother is in charge of doing that. My mom, she's wonderful. Nobody really hears, hears about mm -hmm. her, but she's helped me make the wine every vintage since 88, every year, not to miss one vintage, maybe one when my grandmother passed away. Um, and she does all the lab for me. She's wonderful. Wow. Makes her tea, puts the music, and she does a little bit of analysis. <laughs> and she writes it to write the diary mm. of uh, just during harvest. What happens, the weather, who arrived, what, uh, you know, funny thing happened, uh, something broke. Some so we have tried to do it. Sometimes we're a bit lazy, some day we miss, but we try to. It's mm, fun. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> You talked a little bit earlier about the differences between Burgundy and Oregon in terms of the freedom you have here and, and kind yes. of figuring out what you could do. So tell me about sort of that kind of discovery of what you wanted to do and how you wanted to grow the grapes you wanted to grow. Yeah, so the fact that you really can do what you want and you're not tight. For example, blending. Mm -hmm. So you have your fermenters and you pick this block, it goes to this fermenter and this block goes to this fermenter. And then at the end of the day, yeah, this to make uh, Originally one wine, now we have three Pinot, well actually four, but it's all based on taste and potential of aging and complexity and refinement. Mm -hmm. Well, even if I have a Chambol Musigny Les Amoureuses, I'm not allowed to switch that within the vineyard or call it another name. So we're very tied to our terroir. We, we can blend some Premier Cru and the wine will be called Premier Cru. But here I find the luxury of being able to choose what mm -hmm. I decide is will be the, the best blend, I thought, was such a, a great thing. Also, um, on the winemaking, there's nothing revolutionary that we did. It's very similar to what we do in Burgundy, mm. except, again, the, the quality of fruit. It's so healthy. You don't worry about um, the wine be starting to be fragile or uh, the botrytis mm. making it a little tricky. <coughs> um, in terms of where what. I would say probably more in the vineyard that, mm -hmm. that we have so many options that we can have. Mm -hmm. yeah. How would you describe your winemaking philosophy? Hands off, as much as it's not easy to do a lot. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes to remain simple is more difficult <laughs> mm -hmm. because you always think, oh, I should do something. Uh, get a good feel of the vintage and that you see that quickly when the first room, like 2016, everything was early, but very early, uh, it, it ripened early, we picked early. And so when you start to make the wine, boom, you see color is coming, structure is coming, so okay, I'm not going to do a usual, maybe punch down, pump over, I might be a little bit hands off with the punch down, just to see how the... Mm -hmm. uh, so it's daily detail twice a day. I was a, with a friend yesterday and he said, so how you decide? I said, well, I taste twice a day. He said, really? You taste twice a day? I said, yeah, because that's what will guide you in deciding what to do. And I said, I write on the fermenter. I used to do it, but now I have my strong interns to do it. The punch down or the pump over. And I said, even write how many minutes they should do the pump over because it could go from five to 30. Mm -hmm. So if they don't know, because if I would do it, I can feel when I, I'm happy and I think we should stop, but the kids not necessarily do. So sometimes they, it's funny because I would put seven minutes and 35 seconds and everybody has an iPhone or phone and they do seven minutes, 35 seconds and pop, pump on, pump off. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. And then I get a little drawing. <laughs> I mean, we're fun. <laughs> And tell me about the, the biodynamic farming. I know what your mm -hmm. father was one of the kind of pioneers of that, yeah. at least in France. So tell me about how that's influenced your style. It's actually really my brother. My brother, okay. Yeah, because when Philippe... Um, so my brother Philippe has an interesting path. When he was uh, studying, he did business school and was supposed to take the management of company of Drouin France and, and DDO and all the business part. And my dad said, you're going to run a company that has vineyards and makes wine, so you should go for one year to the Lycée Viticole, Viticulture School to get that program. So you know, we're talking about. And he did. And Philippe found a huge passion for growing grapes. Mm -hmm. So he turned to my dad at the end of that year and he said, Dad, I have to tell you something. I don't want to run a company, but I would love to be in charge of the estate. And so my dad totally respected his choice, probably was a little bit surprised, maybe a little bit disappointed. <laughs> but it's four of us, I had two other brothers, I was already, uh, he and I are very close in age, one year apart. I was already, my past was uh, winemaking. 
and, um, and Philippe took over the vineyard management in 1987. And Philippe, being smart and a bit older than the kids at the school, was asking questions that were not having answers necessarily. Okay, we have this problem, we applied this, pro this chemical, what happens next? How long does it stay in the fruit? Does it stay in the ground? Does it uh, disappear? Does it transform? And he said, I wouldn't get answers or proper answers to mm -hmm. my question. And he said, ultimately, it's going to be a problem. He was so visionary because, of course, we talk a lot about uh, more sustainable farming. So Philippe proposed to the family. He looked around and he was not the only one at the time. So Aubert de Villene from Roman et Conti, Dominique Lafont from Lafont, and Claude Lefleuve. These few people were thinking the same. We should, they should be another way to farm. Mm. And there was a guy in Burgundy, uh, Monsieur Rateau, who has always been farming biodynamically, probably without knowing he was biodynamic, but not using synthetic product and, um, in a, for, for him in a very normal way of farming. And they tasted the wine and talked with him. And then there was a guy, Pierre Masson, who was already a very good expert on mm -hmm. biodynamic farming. So anyway, they start to taste and so he didn't, rush to do it. But he proposed, he said, I propose we go to organic farming. It's not without a risk. We may lose crop. Uh, we, you know, it, it, it might be challenging, but I, I think we should do it. And he said, I propose we do 100% of the estate. We we'll not just try. He actually did try with the Claude des because we have enough vineyards that there's no, not so much impact from the neighbors because it's 14 hectares mm -hmm. one piece which is very big and it's usually very small pieces of vineyard and so he did that and was convinced and if you would talk to Philippe he would say was it a success 100% he said no he said some vines that I thought were to be pulled out because I didn't think that I could put them back to normal production mm -hmm. The result was the biodynamic farming, or first the organic farming was unbelievable, and he said some other were disappointing. Mm. But anyway, he proposes and everyone accepted in the family, let's do it. And we did lose crop, we saw the yield go down, mm -hmm. uh, not lose because you, you get more botrytis or problem, it's just the vines cropped less. Mm -hmm. uh, but the wines got better, the soil got more life, mm -hmm. you, would, you would put a shovel in the in the soil and shake and usually you see worms coming in the normal soil. If you would do it here normally, if they don't spray too much chemicals, there would be a lot of worms. In Burgundy you wouldn't find any worms in the vineyards anymore. And so he was showing to my dad and he said, the soils are dead here, mm -hmm. everywhere. So, and now if you do it, you do that and you see a lot. So bringing back organic life and life mm -hmm. uh, was important to him. And then he went even further, so he wanted to go to the biodynamic farming. So my dad said, uh, you have carte blanche, just do it. And he, he said, I recognize that the vines look nicer than uh, when I took over. The vines, he, he listened to the technical uh, agriculture people who advising, and I say, oh, put some pota potassium in the soil, it won't hurt, put some nitrates in the mm -hmm. soil, it, it will not hurt. If it doesn't hurt, it won't hurt. But it did, but they didn't know, and my dad, of course, didn't know either, he's not a technician. Um, so the vines suddenly look very green, of course, they have a lot of nitrogen. Mm -hmm. But we started to see more botrytis kinking, we started to see more uh, pH going up, and so it did have an impact. Mm -hmm. And so Robert would say, the vines look better, but the wine is not as good as in, in the past. So carte blanche. And so that's what Philippe did, and still today. And so the entire state, Chablis, Côte d'Or, Côte Chalonnaise, is a biodynamic farm. And so here, he would like to be biodynamically farming, which is, we are life certified, but not yet uh, biodynamic. A part of this, it is organically farmed. But what he thinks is you need to have someone on site, because you don't decide to be organic until like you do nothing. Mm -hmm. It's actually, you have to do a lot, and a lot be in the vineyards to see what's happening. So um, our first uh, vineyard manager, was, that was not his vision. So he said, if you want to go this way, I'm not your man. Mm -hmm. And you know, with respect, we said, okay, we understand. So now that has changed. We have new uh, Lee Barthelumer is our mm -hmm. vineyard manager. And of course, she's really, really good and mm -hmm. inclined to uh, work. So we're making a lot of, um, um, let's say, progress to mm -hmm. being more and more uh, biodynamically farming, not yet, but hopefully someday. Mm -hmm. yeah.
exciting. It's exciting. It is, yeah. It is. So, uh, having the experience you have in two very similar but different wine regions, tell me about mm -hmm. the, how you compare Willamette Valley with Burgundy. Uh, how are they similar? How are they different? What are the, what are the, how's the culture different? Oh, uh, so what's similar is the, is the landscape. I mean, the, the fact that the vines are mostly facing east, mm -hmm. the southeast, mm -hmm. if you do come to Côte d'Or. Uh, I'm talking mostly Côte d'Or. Chablis is a little bit different, and the Beaujolais, well, no, the Beaujolais is similar. It's also all south, southeast facing. So the climate was the reason my dad was very interested in Oregon. As you know, as we all know, you've heard this over and over probably before, but the, um, the, the climate where Pinot is comfortable is very small. It's mm -hmm. probably one of the smallest for the varieties. Too cold, doesn't like, doesn't get ripe, too warm, will get ripe, but it's like not Pinot anymore. Mm -hmm. And so the range is very small. So not so many places on the planet have that. Oregon has, has it. And so th in that regard, it's very similar to Burgundy. But there's, there's some difference, like when do you get your rain? You get a lot in the winter, very little in the summer. We get rain all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, less in the summer, but still we get some. Um, the summer heat is, I think, also different. It's mm -hmm. less, probably less warm in the summer in Burgundy and it's here. And then, of course, the soil, totally different soil. We have limestone, you have volcanic mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, DDO is entirely on volcanic sign, it's Jory. Mm -hmm. Rose Rock has Nikaya and Jory, so it's, it's still very volcanic soil. We are, have nothing for DDO on uh, sedimentary soil, but we buy great for cloud line, which is a Pinot Noir that we love very much that we uh, uh, make. Uh, that some fruit comes from the sedimentary soil. Mm. And so that's a huge difference, mm -hmm. of course. And the um, result in the wines is, which was a good surprise to us, was like, gee, the color is nice when you're after the other. So it's not something you have to try and work. Well, baking is sometimes is tricky. Mm -hmm. You want to get more color, but the more you extract, the less elegant the one will be. So finding the right balance is not always easy. So here you have beautiful color. Check. <laughs> <laughs> then um, the texture of the wine. If you don't overwork the fruit, uh, which you don't have to do, beautiful texture. So the goal being to make elegant wines. You don't want to extract too much mm -hmm. sunnies, but you want enough weight in the wine. Uh, so that's really nice. Now, maybe Burgundy with low yield, good vintage, the level of refinement we reach in the best vineyards, like Musigny or the vineyards of mm -hmm. Chambol, is still maybe up there. I'm not saying Oregon we will not get there, but I think now, um, yeah, Burgundy remains, but Burgundy is, is not Oregon. Mm -hmm. And what has been interesting to me is the vines uh, have gone older. My oldest vines are 30 years old, and we've been planting not everything at once. And so we make wine every year from different blocks, but it's a slow process. But every wine you get, tasting notes and you get a, a style from that block. What is very interesting is to see the consistency of certain blocks. Like mm -hmm. now I have my little favorites. This one I'm sure I will make sure to keep it separate and vinify it separate because mm -hmm. it's always making one that mm -hmm. is very complex. So we do have terroir and I think we are like the monks who in the 12th century were finding where the best terroir are. And that's what all of us in Oregon have been doing for the past, I would say 50 years, David, let's start with it. Um, so that's fascinating and, mm -hmm. and there's still a lot to discover, but we are nailing down to more defined terroir. Mm -hmm. AVA happens where it didn't exist before. And then within the AVAs on each of us property, we are finding little pockets here and there. Mm -hmm. Some of my blocks, I know we will never make the best wine because the past 30 years they never did. Sometimes I have a good surprise. <laughs> uh, and then some of the work always did. Mm -hmm. So I'm finding my grand cru, my mm -hmm. <laughs> premier cru. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Sure. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned Rose Rock a couple of times. So tell us mm -hmm. about that project and why you're excited about it. I'm very excited. So for Cloudline, we did need to find fruit. So one of the supply was from Rose Rock. So Rose Rock was, I don't know if you know history of Rose Rock, but it was planted by uh, CalPERS, a PPV, pension plan from California, mm -hmm. big group, who planted extremely well this vineyard in the uh, early 2000. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that's the 
program of such um, investment, you do it for a couple of years and then you sell it to cash out. And probably they realized that grape growing and grape selling was not making the most income. So they have agreed to, to sell it. And Rose Rock was selling fruit to a lot of producers in the valley. And everyone was very excited with this fruit. Mm -hmm. So when that was for sale, we thought, it's too big for us. We don't have the space to make the wine, but we know that the wine we made from the one block we bought was very good. So we said we should make a proposition because we did need wine for grapes for Cloudline. So we made an offer. And we were told uh, a couple of months later, okay, Drouin, your offer was good, but not good enough. You have competition here. And we said, there's not much room for us to grow, but okay, we make it a little bit better. So in the end, I don't know if our offer was the best, probably not. Um, but maybe the fact that we had been here for a long time, but, uh, our goal was to make good wines. Uh, anyway, we happen uh, close to Christmas of 2013 that we are the happy owners <laughs> of 50 hectares of vineyards in uh, Rose Rock of Rose Rock. 45 of Pinot and four of Chardonnay, almost exactly the same as Didio. Didio is 45 of Pinot and five of Chardonnay. So here we are with 50 hectares. So then um, 2014 is the first vintage. And, and uh, you know, that's why I said it's a new chapter for Drouin. I don't have the space to make all the wine. So some of my friends that have extra capacity, mm -hmm. uh, the grapes go there and we have because we've known each other for a long time, so they know the style. We have a little a protocol. I keep all the Chardonnay. Et voilà. And it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. And Philippe has done the same. So the first year, we asked our, our friend to do um, individually 35 blocks, mm -hmm. just to see if we would see difference in the wines, and there were. So now we kind of already see the um, parts of the estate that we think mm -hmm. are doing the better wines. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very, and there's potential to grow because not all of it was planted. It's a beautiful site. From there, you see the five peaks, mm -hmm. through St. Helic, Jefferson, and really. And it's interesting, it's a different AVA, and for good reason. It's cooler, mm -hmm. it's Eola uh, Imitil. We are the southern tip of the Eola Imitil, so very close to Salem. Um, we do see the grapes ripen a bit later, which is great. I think with the global warming, it's very good news. Mm. Uh, Pinot is very happy there. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's exciting. And we wanted Rose Rock, which the name, we didn't give the name, it was called Rose Rock, which I like very much. And so we want that little name to live on its own. So it's Rose Rock Drouin, Oregon, but we didn't put it under the brand of the Main Drouin, which have been easier, because it's already well known. But this little, you know, wine is making its own path, which mm. I'm really happy. It's different, the wine is very floral. Mm just got the perfect name, Rose. <laughs> the label has a little rose for the Pinot, a little rock for the Chardonnay. But the name of the property is Rose Rock in one word. <laughs> but I just thought it was cute. And uh, our, our uh, let's say reserve Pinot is called Zephyrin. Mm -hmm. And Zephyrin is the name of a rose, mm -hmm. but originally it's the name of a woman. And as a gift, which I think it's such a wonderful gift, when she was probably 21, this is in 1870s, she got a rose made for her and named after her. I think it's such a lovely gift. And so the name, the rose was named Zephyrin, but the funny part, her last name was Drouin. <laughs> so she was from Burgundy. We don't know that we were related. Uh, well, maybe we were, but a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And the rose has no thorn. So it's a beautiful rose. So we thought it's a perfect name for this wine. So we planted some Zephyrin at Didio. It's a lovely rose, it smells delicious. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how Zephyrin was born. Amazing. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. You talked a little bit earlier about kind of growing up well, with your father and the brothers and, and kind of thinking of, of Burgundy as kind of a man's domain, wine there, and then sort of having your having that kind of light come on for you when, mm -hmm. when you were younger. Tell me what it's like now sort of being a woman in the wine industry, but both here and in Burgundy, since you, of course, are, are Honestly, both worlds. very easy. No, really. I've never, never felt, even a long time ago, I never felt that it was hard or I wouldn't be welcome somewhere mm -hmm. or... There's a lot of women winemakers, there's a lot of uh, younger uh, women that have taken over where the brother didn't want to, or they didn't have brothers. I mean, take the Minure sisters. It's the third generation of women running the estate, and they are amazingly successful and making gorgeous wine. And Claude Lefebvre sadly passed away. She was an amazing woman. So I think honestly this male, some, some of my friends might say, oh, I still feel a little, no, for me, 
not really. Good. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a bit about, about the future a little bit. Uh, you obviously you have, you have the Rose, kind of Rose Rock just getting going. You have your yes. original site. So what is it the future for Domain Drew in Oregon and, and, and the Rose Rock part of it as well? What do you see as you look, say, 10 years into the future? Well, uh, I think DDO, there's not much that will happen in terms of more, more grapes because we have not totally planted, but almost totally planted the mm -hmm. estate. Um, so the idea with DDO is to continue making great wines and and then hopefully the family will continue because we talk about the four Drew and children taking over but all of us are in the in our 50s now <laughs> so we need to think about the future in terms of is anyone going to be interested mm -hmm. and uh, for Burgundy I mean for Burgundy is the same and for Rose Rock well Rose Rock the goal is hopefully someday to build a winery. So Rose Rock has its own winery to maybe finish planting the, the because there's still quite room. But I think it's important not to go too fast because Rose Rock, the first vintage for us uh, to have the entire estate is 2014. Mm -hmm. So on the scale of time, it's not much. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to push it too, too far. And uh, it's a big investment to build a winery. So we, we need to make sure the, the you know, the brand is, uh, is doing okay, it has good distribution, it's well received, which I'm touching when it's the case, but uh, yeah, yeah. So obviously you come from a background of a wine industry that's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years and is, is well established. Oh, and 140 next year, so nice. it's not hundreds and hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> for, for your company in general, but, but the industry itself is, is old and, and established and, and here in Oregon we're still, we're still pretty new. So mm -hmm. what are you seeing in terms of Oregon kind of growing up and as you look into the future for Oregon at, at, overall as an industry in the next decade? I think uh, the curve at the start was slow and then it kind of speeded up quickly. Uh, you know, we were saying we have 780 wineries. On the scale of the production in US, we're still very small, mm -hmm. but I think the reputation of Oregon will keep growing, which is great, and that's the best you could dream of. I think there's going to be more investment from outside. Mm -hmm. We already see it from mm -hmm. California. Mm -hmm but uh, also from Burgundy, and I think it's not the end. We might see more. It's not one that I know is looking, but I know it's tickling the, a lot of my uh, friends in Burgundy. It's, it's very difficult to buy vineyards in Burgundy mm -hmm. anymore. Um, they try the wines, they try the wine from all these great producers. So I think Oregon has a really, really good future. And mm -hmm. the, you see second generation take over, you see the team. I mean, at DDO, we have an amazing team. We're not living here. So we have David running the business, mm -hmm. I have Aaron, uh, my assistant, 15 years at the winery, his wife, 15 years at the winery. It's becoming quite uh, European <laughs> <laughs> for people to stay that long. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, I think it really has a good future. Good mm -hmm. future. I'm just hoping not so many more cars are here <laughs> because driving is not as easy as it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> not even close, no. No. <laughs> um, as you look back uh, over your time in the Oregon wine industry, what are you, what are you proudest of, of, of personal accomplishment? What do you look back with most pride? Uh, uh, well, the reputation we have established for, for DDO. I'm really proud of um, walking to restaurants that carry the wine or private consumer that taste the wine and you know, very often getting compliments. Mm -hmm. We really love your wine and that's something I'm, you know, it's, it, it was not something that was necessarily going to happen when we started. And as I said before, the past has been a lot of work, mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of reward also, mm -hmm. and a lot of pleasure. So yeah, I would say to, yeah, I've been able to achieve this with not living here, having a family living in Burgundy, which on the, if there was only one thing that was not easy, um, on personal side was uh, raising three kids and being in Oregon so much. Mm -hmm. Especially my husband, he didn't like so much the harvest where I would be here for four or five weeks leaving three young children that um, he had to feed, he had to dress, I mean, <laughs> take care of. Sure, yeah. sure. Do you think you want to ask? So all the questions that I have for you, is there anything I should have asked that I didn't, anything we didn't cover that we should have? Um, well, I think we covered a lot. <laughs> I think um, so. What? No, I think. All right. Yeah.
Well, thank you so, so much for your time and for You're your welcome. answers and wonderful stories. And uh, we'll go ahead and let you off the hook.